Hi, everyone. You probably all are aware of the acronym RFID. May I briefly ask who is not? Okay, it's a few people, but um, she knows now. Um, RFIDs, well, you have probably followed a few of the discussions and concerns in regards to RFID and the implications on privacy. Our speaker is from the Freie Universität Amsterdam, and she works there with um, Andy Tannenbaum on certain implications with research jamming and privacy concerns. Melanie Rebeck, please welcome her. All right. Uh, can you all hear me? Great. So I'm going to talk about RFID today. Um, I suppose there wouldn't be three talks at this conference uh, in RFID if you all weren't relatively aware <laughs> of what this was as an issue. Uh, just as a funny si aside, I'm, I'm here to talk to you about today about RFID security and privacy, but I spent about five minutes yesterday in the queue waiting to pay 10 euros for one of these uh, little Sputnik uh, tracking devices. <laughs> so sometimes we know better, but, uh, but go figure. So. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about, uh, basically, as a hacker, what can you do uh, to interfere with RFID systems, but also more generically, as a, a person and as a consumer, what can you do to protect yourself against the technology? So I'm going to give a really brief intro, uh, not too long, because all of you seem to know what RFID is. Uh, but just generically, uh, for those who don't know, uh, the most important message to kind of take away about what is RFID is it's exactly what it sounds like. RF radio frequency, ID, identification. I mean, people have called it, uh, you know, like radio barcodes on steroids. That's sort of one way to, to kind of think about it. <laughs> um, but, but they come in all kinds of shapes and forms. I mean, sometimes they look like uh, these little stickers uh, that you have here. You have RF, uh, active RFID devices like these uh, well-designed uh, Sputniks here. You have uh, building access passes, which kind of look almost like credit card formats. But the main thing is they all use very similar technology. And essentially, the way that it works is you have a reading device. It emits some kind of a radio field that then uh, powers the tag. And then the tag uses that energy to actually uh, send its signal back. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about the actual mechanics of how that works. But for now, that's uh, pretty sufficient for what you need to know about the technology itself. But of course, what's really interesting about RFID is everything that it's used for. So uh, of course, uh, for you know, organizations with really huge supply chains, like the Department of Defense in the US and, and Walmart, I mean, this is like you know, a dream come true. Because their hope is, you know, if you have all these little objects and you need to you know, keep track of them, and there's some kind of process, they can optimize this process and make massive return on investment. This is like, if you go to any of their conferences, this is what you keep hearing over and over and over from them. And, uh, but they've really been pushing the technology. So, uh, I mean, also, uh, I believe uh, they're using it for anti-counterfeiting. I think uh, either it's the talk after me or the talk tomorrow, I believe, is going to be talking about the, uh, uh, the Euro uh, World Cup uh, tickets and perhaps whether you're able to break that or not. Um, additionally, they're using RFID for uh, b paying for things. Like, for example, uh, I'm not sure what, what, what you have in Germany, but at least in the Netherlands, uh, we have a system called the, uh, the chip knip. It's uh, basically you just have a, a pass and it has this little contact uh, smart card on it and you use it for small payments. So if you purchase, for example, a soda from a vending machine, you can just put your little card in, and then offline it can actually do these transactions. Well, their idea is why not make this contactless? So using either contactless cards or using things like mobile devices, for example, like cell phones. I mean, Philips is coming up with near-field communications technology. Also in Japan, this stuff is huge. I mean, Sony, uh, Sony has this, uh, this brand called uh, Felica that they use. You can literally use a wristwatch. And you can just you know, purchase your uh, candy bar from a machine, use your watch to pay for it. And, and their, their vision is, you know, this is easy, this is fast, and this is just going to make everybody's lives easier and ultimately save the company's money as well. Uh, but why stop there? I mean, if you're tracking uh, other objects, I mean, they want to use it for uh, luggage tracking in, uh, in airports, you know, just to make sure. I mean, nobody wants to get their, uh, their suitcase uh, lost. <laughs> So they figure, you know, you can make lives better and easier with this. 
uh, they, they want to track animals with it. Um, for example, they've been uh, taking these, uh, these chips, they put them in your dogs, they put them in your cats, uh, they put them in your ferrets. I actually saw a ferret get injected with one of these chips once, and it, for about like 10 seconds it made clucking noises like a chicken. And then uh, five minutes later, it was off chewing the carpet again. So <laughs> actually, the pet owner was more traumatized by the whole procedure. But the point is, if the ferret now gets lost, and somebody, uh, you know, perhaps the, uh, the police or, or the local animal, uh, the kennel or whatever, finds this ferret, they can now scan it. And assuming that you're using compatible standards, which you may or may not be, uh, they can scan your ferret and then say, oh, you know, this belongs to uh, you know, whoever, and we can get you know, Fluffy back to his or her owner. So, you know. Uh, they also want to use this for uh, other kinds of animals, like uh, with a cow here, you can see they're, they're using RFID chips in the ears of cows. I mean, certainly in the, in the last five years, we've had a lot of incidents with uh, foot and mouth disease in animals. Of course, uh, mad cow disease was a big one before that. The point is, if there's an infected animal, what they want to do is they want to track back to find out where the sick animal came from, figure out whether there are any other, any other sick animals, and then perhaps, uh, well, get rid of those animals, but just you know, for the greater good of, of, of all the animals that then are, are, are healthy. And then once again, hoping that none of this bad meat is also going to make its way to the consumer. So, but why stop there? Why stop at animals? Um, I mean, there's all kinds of ways that you can use RFID also for doing useful things with people. So, you know, there's this, uh, there's this company. Uh, uh, they, actually, uh, they actually make these little wristbands for babies, and they'll put these RFID wristbands on babies just to make sure that, you know, if they get sort of, you know, smuggled out of the hospital that, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe there's like some reader or something at the door that goes beep, 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 you know, if you try to take the wrong baby out. And <laughs> yeah, and, and, and they figure, you know, this is just useful technology. And of course, the new passports, I mean, you know, who can, who, who can miss that? That's been such a source of controversy over the last, uh, over, over the last six months to a year for sure. And uh, w whether or not it's really going to make our borders safer, <laughs> the point is they're here now. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure uh, some of you have been issued them already, also in the UK, in the Netherlands, in the United States. Uh, we tend to be the source of these things. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, that's another anti-counterfeiting application, actually. Uh, but another way that you can apply RFID technology to people <laughs> for trying to uh, well, ha have all these desirable uh, ends with the technology. So there's one other t uh, application of RFID technology, and this is absolutely my favorite. Uh, there's something called the VeraChip. Now, there's a club in Rotterdam. It's about 15 minutes from where my apartment is located. And they have something called the VIP chip. And what this is, it's like almost exactly the same kind of uh, chip as they put in the ferrets. Actually, it was originally used in, uh, in salmon. And what they do is they will actually inject this chip into your arm. And so the first thing you do is when you go to this club, I mean, of course, first you have to sign the paperwork, you know, the usual indemnity, uh, indemnity clauses. And then any GP can inject this thing into your arm. So once you actually have this chip in your arm, You're feeling good. <laughs> and, and, and some of the benefits uh, of having this chip at the Baja Beach Club is for 1,000 euros, you can purchase uh, one of these chips and, and you can get 1,500 euros worth of drink money. All right? So, uh, so, but the point is, I mean, you know, this gives you everything. Because, I mean, first of all, you, you have exclusive access to their VIP deck, uh, the Princess Marmika deck. And they have these guys serving these drinks in sailor uniforms. <laughs> so if you go for that, it's, you know, <laughs> this is totally a plus. <laughs> and, and the way that it works is once you have one of these chips, they take one of these readers. Uh, and as you can see, they will scan your arm. You have a number. You're a number now. And when you want to buy a drink now, uh, the screen comes up. And that's essentially then how you pay for your drink. 
And uh, I have to say, believe it or not, there is actually a waiting list for these things. I have spoken with uh, the PR person from the Baja Beach Club, and I, there are a couple hundred people with these chips, but there's also a waiting list with another like, number of hundreds of people. Because <laughs> this is so exclusive, <laughs> and they actually want to limit the number of people that can get these VIP j uh, chips because their deck is only so big, you know? <laughs> so... Um, But, but then, of course, this leads to the inevitable question, what about security? <laughs> Details. So uh, a, a journalist at one point had asked the CEO of Applied Digital, the company that makes these chips, so tell me, what about security? And his answer was, their, implied, their implantable chips do not employ cryptography as of yet, but the system is nevertheless safe because its chips can only be read by the company's proprietary scanners. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, uh, and this sort of brings me to, uh, to, to, to a bit of a segue that if, I don't know if any of you all catch uh, one of the speakers yesterday, uh, Annalie Newitz, <laughs> but uh, her and uh, another guy named Jonathan Westhues did a presentation at Hope uh, in New York, I think it was about six months ago, and they demonstrated something called the Verichip cloner. <laughs> And, yeah, that doesn't need any further explanation, <laughs> so... Um, right, but, uh, but, but that's not... The, Verichips aren't the only chips that have security problems. Uh, these chips just generically face a number of security challenges. And the most obvious one is unauthorized tag reading. Now, generally, if you have uh, cheap chips, not just like Verichips that don't have cryptography, but also uh, like EPC, electronic product code tags, they... I mean, there's an uh, organization called EPC Global, and they envision that they're going to have these tags like five cents, 10 cents. You could put one on every, uh, you know, every uh, little thing of chewing gum. <laughs> so that's why they need the, the, the cost to be so low. But the point is that with something that is so low, uh, that is so cheap and so power limited, they can't always, I mean, security is always the first thing to go. So they can't, these tags cannot always control who can access their data and who cannot. Uh, sometimes these tags will, have, uh, will be able to kill themselves. I mean, these EPC tags in particular have something called a kill command, and this uh, is password protected. But uh, generally, though, things like sleep and wake modes and, and cryptography, this is sort of usually saved more exclusively for the expensive tags, which are useful for some applications, but not all of them. Uh, eavesdropping, I mean, generally there's about a 90 decibel difference between the strength of the signal coming from the reader and then the actual distance at which you can read the tag response. So the point is that if uh, revealing information is given in the reader query, for example, when you're singulating the tags, trying to f uh, figure out if there's multiple tags present, which tags are actually out there, then... Uh, you can actually get information about which tags are there from a larger distance away. Um, tracking. This is sort of the most obvious one. RFID is designed for tracking, <laughs> but you want to have the consent of people. And uh, certainly if, 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 if we're dealing with uh, tracking objects, people should be aware and sh people should be able to opt in <laughs> about uh, whether or not these uh, objects are going to be tracked or not. Tag cloning, I already talked about this a little bit. If you have one of these Vera chips and you have a thousand euros worth of drink money on it, you certainly don't want someone else, you know, making a, making a clone of your tag. And then, you know, now they can pay for their drinks with your money. So the point is, people have also cloned other RFID tags, like the ExxonMobil SpeedPass was sort of a no notorious case of a, of a tag that was cloned. Uh, there, there's actually pretty big financial incentives for why people would want to do this. Uh, car immobilization systems is, is sort of another big one that's obvious. And as soon as they start using RFID tags in currency, and, you know, yet, yes, there were rumors about that about a year ago, and then, you know, the European Central Bank quieted down. Well, let, let me tell you, they haven't dropped it. <laughs> I know for sure that there are still people that are still working on, uh, on these MU chips. And believe it or not, another kind of interesting tidbit is they're actually working on making tags that you cannot destroy by putting into the microwave. <laughs> really, seriously, microwave-proof tags. So, <laughs> this is, you know, this is the cat and mouse game that, that's, that's coming up. 
and, uh, and denial of service. I mean, speaking of microwaves. <laughs> Uh, but the point is, if you're relying, for example, on these Vera chips for, for more things than just your drink money, let's say you put medical information on them. The CTO of Harvard Medical, uh, this guy named John Halamka, he's making a big point that, you know, I think we can put useful medical data on. I mean, imagine what happens if, if I, I'm in Amsterdam, I get hit by a bicycle, you know. <laughs> I'm lying there unconscious, and, and, <laughs> and they need some relevant piece of information. Like, for example, I'm, I'm allergic to penicillin. Uh, I mean, in theory, they should be able to get this information then, or at least be able to get an ID that leads to that information from your chip. But what happens if at the critical moment they can't read it? Life and death problem, right? Also, with uh, theft control tags, I mean, RFID that's used for uh, automatic checkout purposes, th that's sort of an easier uh, example of, of how you can understand why if the tag doesn't work, <laughs> effectively you're breaking the system. Uh, another problem, uh, well, probably about back in, I, I think, March uh, of 2006, I decided that RFID didn't have enough problems as it was. So I was working on how can you launch hacking attacks. I'm talking like exploits, like buffer overflows, code injection attacks, SQL injection attacks. How can you launch these from RFID tags? I mean, sort of for the security community, this is a no-brainer. That, I mean, you know, RFID tags are just data storage, just like USB sticks, just like floppy disks. You know, why wouldn't you be able to put malicious data on there? But this was a big shock to the RFID industry. <laughs> and uh, I, <laughs> after, I mean, seriously, I mean, things were just crazy after my paper came out. And it was sort of like within a week after, or actually two, within like two days after my paper comes out, I mean, like AIM Global, one of the really big consortiums for, for you know, automatic identification is putting out these press releases that no one would ever, you know, we would never make such stupid mistakes as like, you know, not, you know, checking, our, you know, the boundaries of our buffers and, uh, <laughs> and, not, and not sanitizing our data. So, <laughs> so there you have it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but also as a hacker, uh, we, we've been working on two more things, as the uh, title of this presentation would indicate. RFID spoofing and jamming. So I've, I've created a device, actually a team of, uh, a team of people that I've been working with at, uh, at the Fry University. We've created a device uh, that can do spoofing and jamming and more. Uh, probably when I submitted this talk proposal about six months ago, spoofing and jamming was like the focus. Since then, the focus has moved a little bit more towards privacy. But for right now, I'm going to show you guys pretty much how this works. So wh what is spoofing and jamming? I mean, besides sort of the, the obvious. Well, false positives. We can make multiple tags appear to exist that actually are not there. I will show you guys later exactly how the spoofing works. But the point is, with the ISO tags that we're using, uh, there are 16 time slots and it's anti-collision. So we can actually, at any one inventory query, pretend to be up to 16 tags at once. And if a tag is repeatedly polling, it's unlimited, the number of tags that we can, pr we can pretend to be. False negatives. You know, maybe, you know, there are tags that are actually there, but you don't want other readers reading them. Well, we can make tags that are actually there. We can essentially block, uh, selectively block their tag responses and make them effectively disappear. So just like uh, sort of the games that you can play uh, with, with intrusion detection, <laughs> I mean, you can make false positives happen. You can make false negatives happen. Big data problem <laughs> uh, for the owners of the RFID. Uh, Installations. I mean, especially if they're trying to scan tags, you know, that belong to you and they shouldn't be reading anyway. Also, invalid RFID packets. This is something we also sort of played around with. Uh, this is going back to the whole malware idea, but we actually have uh, created packets that were sort of suitably enough malformed that managed to crash the, uh, the RFID applications from Philips that we were testing it with. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, this is something else you can do. Of course, as a hacker, this is more interesting than, uh, th than just, you know, for a consumer. Uh, but I have a video for you now. Um, this is actually my adv advisor. Okay, I have a book here. Uh, We've second. attached to the... Ah, 
Uh, sorry, but just uh, before I play it for you, though, I just want to tell a little tiny story about it. So the, 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 that guy is my advisor, and well, he's going to show you uh, essentially a small kind of demo of uh, what the device is and how it works. But I just want to tell you one story. Uh, there was a woman named uh, Catherine Albrecht. Uh, she works for an organization called Caspian. It's basically, I mean, I'll take the liberties to say it's sort of the American version of FUBUD, <laughs> kind of, not exactly. <laughs> okay, maybe not, but, but they're busy with some of the same kinds of things. And the point is they're sort of anti-supermarket um, uh, loyalty cards and they're very anti-RFID. So the point is they had an EPC Global meeting one time, sort of at the very beginning. And, you know, they're, ha they're having an orderly meeting and then Catherine Albrecht runs in, and it turns out that they're actually doing some trials of RFID on clothing. And she's like, you know, I don't want anybody with a scanner to be able to know what kind of bra I'm wearing. <laughs> so, and with that, now I'm going to show you the video. Okay, I have a book here, and we've attached to the book an RFID tag. And in the future, all books and many other products will have RFID tags attached to them. And now I'm going to demonstrate how the RFID tag is detected by the reader. So I'm going to move the tag in the book over to our reader over here. And you'll see on the screen, which is connected to the computer and the reader, that it's detected. So I gradually move the book within reading range. And you see it appears on the screen. I move it away. It disappears. I put it back. It's going to appear again. And I'll balance it on there sort of gently. Okay, so you see that the tag has been detected. Now, I have a piece of clothing, and clothing <laughs> also has an RFID tag. In the future, clothing will have RFID tags, so when you put the clothing in the washing machine, the smart washing machine will be able to ask the clothing, at what temperature do you want to be washed, and the clothing will answer directly, so no person has to set the, the parameters on the washing machine. In this case, we put the tag on ourselves, but later it will be sewn into the clothing. Okay. Now I'm going to go over to the reader and put this within range, and you'll see that this is also detected. See there on the screen, it's, it's come, it's noticed it, and move it away, it goes away, and come back. It's detected again. So the reader is detecting both objects at the same time. You can imagine that not everybody is happy with the idea of random strangers reading out the tags in their clothing at a distance. So part of our research is to build a device which will help protect your privacy. This device we call the RFID Guardian, and we built a little prototype of it. And over here, you can see the prototype. It's a little board with some chips on it and some analog electronics for managing the radio. It's got an antenna, okay? And the idea is you could carry around a smaller version of this, perhaps integrated with a cell phone, or a PDA, and then it would block the scans of hostile readers looking at tags you don't want the world to see. Now we're going to demonstrate, when we turn on the Guardian, then the piece of clothing will be blocked, but the book, the tag on the book will not be blocked. Okay? Now, record, turn on the Guardian, and you see over here that the piece of clothing has been blocked, but the book has not been blocked, because the Guardian has been set up to block one of the tags, but not the other one. So in this way, your privacy is protected. Uh, I want to add there's actually a second video uh, that's on our website uh, that also shows a demonstration of spoofing. I didn't want to play both videos here because there was a bit of redundancy across, uh, across the two videos. Uh, and clearly you can understand why I wanted to put the other video on our website and not this one. <laughs> so at least that was Andy's request. <laughs> so, uh, but, but the point is, uh, yes, so uh, the prototype. So uh, what we actually have demonstrated in this video is version two uh, of our RFID Guardian prototype. We actually do have a version one, and anybody who looks at our website, actually the video that's still online is a version one, uh, which was a bit more of a sprawling kind of hand soldered with love, you know, kind of device. <laughs> and uh, well, this was slightly more uh, probably, well, professionally done, you could say. But, but let me explain real quick to you uh, what the major components are of the Guardian and 
basically how this works. I'm going to use this little arrow to kind of point here. Uh, first of all, what you see here is something called a CPLD. It's a lot like an FPGA. So what we're doing is a lot of the uh, things we're doing, like the uh, modulation of the signal and the bit encoding, a lot of this we're actually handling uh, using VHDL in uh, this uh, CPLD. We have an analog front end. Uh, you can't see it in this picture, but there are two antennas. Uh, you actually could see it in the video, two sort of yellow antennas. And they plug into, uh, there's actually one connector right here and another connector uh, right over, what? yeah, that was right there, that, uh, where, where you can plug uh, both of these antennas. Uh, also, what you have is a serial cable uh, for, um, for version two, this is essentially the way that you interact with our device. So at this point, we actually do have a PC, <laughs> and we have sort of a guy that, that's sitting behind the PC who is like manually turning the thing off and on. Of course, we know that this isn't ideal, and uh, we're in the next version of our device, yes, we're at, we are making a next version of our device, and I'll show you pictures of it, uh, of, of you know where we're at with that at the end. Uh, but the point is. Uh, uh, you should try and come up with some kind of way in the field to actually make a person be able to access uh, this device a bit easier. Uh, ignore these things right here, they're bug fixes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what's also kind of interesting uh, right here, uh, this thing is a RFID reader on a chip. Uh, we purchased one from a company called Malexis. Uh, I should also say that uh, our device works with a couple different standards. Our device only works at 13.56 at megahertz. We've had a lot of discussion about this. You probably could uh, add a bit, bit of an extra analog front end and also support LF RFID uh, with this general design. Uh, but basically, I mean, there's several different kinds of RFID. I mean, some of them use gigahertz, kind of like uh, the Sputnik here does. <laughs> and the point is, uh, you, you would essentially need an analog front end for each individual frequency <laughs> that you would want to use this device uh, with. This is a, sort of an engineering problem we're thinking about if, you know, th there would be a way to make this easier. <laughs> uh, even, I think, with... Uh, uh, Jonathan West uses Prox uh, Card Cloner that supports both uh, HF and LF RFID. He's also using a separate analog front end for that. So, we, I mean, that's sort of one d design challenge with it. But, uh, w but what we can support right now with this is uh, ISO 15693, this is a standard that's uh, commonly used for things like access control, uh, some kinds of supply chain management, and ISO 14443. And this is an especially interesting standard because this is what the new passports use. Uh, also, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, there's also something called MyFair. MyFair is essentially almost identical to ISO 14443A. Uh, also, our public transportation cards. Uh, we have something called the OVE chip card uh, that was just introduced uh, that also uses the same standard. <laughs> so we basically tried to pick at least one standard that we could target towards a couple of sort of you know, commonly used applications so we could demonstrate why uh, such a device would actually be useful to some sort of real-world applications of RFID. And uh, if you look at the back of uh, the RFID Guardian, this is also what it looks like. Uh, what you're going to see at the top half is uh, basically some power circuitry. But what's really interesting is this bit right here at the bottom. What this is, is this is called a Triton module. There's a company called Strategic Test. They're actually a German company uh, that produces these. And what this is, is uh, there's a, a PXA270X scale processor. So, I mean, basically, this is like a, this is a workhorse of a processor. And we deliberately chose uh, the PXA270 because it's commonly used in PDAs. It's commonly used in cell phones. And sort of part of the point that we want to get over here is the device that we have created could very easily be integrated into a, a mobile consumer device. And, and ultimately, this would sort of be our intention of, I mean, the electronics uh, that we've actually made are not more complicated, for example, than what uh, uh, Nokia is already putting into their cell phones with near-field communications. So, uh, but yeah, so we've got a major processor on these things. Also, this, this Triton module also uh, has some flash memory. It has all the RAM. It's basically just sort of like a little 
pre-made unit. They're very handy. It's been really great for prototyping. It's a bit more horsepower than we need, but we figured that for right now it's better to do overkill than <laughs> to choose you know, a little pick and then run across the limitations uh, uh, at the wrong time. So th this is why we've chosen this for now. Uh, so I'm going to explain a bit about how the, uh, how the spoofing works. Now, if you take a look at this uh, diagram here, uh, first I have to say I have blatantly stolen this from the RFID handbook by Klaus Finkenzeller. It's a great book if you want to learn about RFID. Uh, but what you're going to notice, uh, you're going to have a large peak in the middle. Uh, if this was uh, the kind of RFID that we're using, then this peak would be at 13.56 megahertz. Now, when the tag uh, produces a response, the way that it works is it flips on and off uh, something called a load modulation resistor. So basically, the reader and the tag are making what's called an inductive coupling. It's almost sort of just like kind of an electromagnetic coupling, so that when this resistor goes on and off, the reader can just feel it. <laughs> and the way, way that it works is then uh, it produces these things called sidebands that are uh, a small number of kilohertz on either side of this carrier frequency. And it's actually the sidebands, it's actually these two little peaks that contain the tag response, that contain the actual information. And it's the challenge and it's the task of the reader to filter out this really massive uh, carrier signal. Because remember, this is just noise. This is a signal that the reader is producing. So it already knows you know, exactly what, what information is there. But just it needs to have pretty sophisticated circuitry to pluck out these two little tiny sidebands. So, and, and as I mentioned before, there's a 90 decibel difference between the strength of this carrier signal and the strength of these little tiny sidebands. So, uh, this is what the RFID Guardian does. You're going to notice this picture is a little different. Uh, first, you know, ignore everything that's on like these sides of the sidebands because, uh, well, that's just noise, and, and you know that's what happens in the real world. But what, what you're going to see is that in the middle of this picture here at 13.56 megahertz, this is the carrier signal. But on either side of the carrier signal, there are just these massive sidebands. In fact, the sideband on the left side here is actually bigger than the carrier signal itself. <laughs> uh, so w what are we doing? When we first decided how we wanted to emulate a tag, we thought, you know, gee, maybe we can just, you know, also have a little resistor and flip that on and off in time with the, you know, with the standard. But if we did that, we would be reacting passively just like a tag, and we would have the same range limitations as a tag. But instead, what we decided to do is we are actually making a, an active transmitter that just transmits these two sideband frequencies actively. And basically, the only thing that this is limited by are relevant regulations <laughs> about RF emissions. So uh, in generating these massive sidebands, uh, at least with, uh, with, with, with version, well, as we, yeah, we got slightly better performance from version one than version two. We're, we're, we're actually optimizing it now with version three. But, but the point is, the, act, the largest distance that I saw the RFID Guardian work was almost a meter. So the point is we can transmit these tag uh, responses at basically the limits of the range of, of how far away we can hear the reader. <laughs> uh, whereas, indeed, a tag would just be limited to the 10 centimeters or you know, maybe 30 centimeters, <laughs> if you're lucky, uh, if we did it passively. Uh, of course, once we have these sideband frequencies, I should add, we also had to implement our own ISO stacks. <laughs> Because then, of course, I mean, once you just have you know the raw data that's being transmitted, I mean, then of course we have to make put, we have to make bits out of it, and we have to make frames out of it, and we have to, on the higher level, actually be able to uh, re respond with real answers. <laughs> so all of this was very well dictated by the uh, by the ISO standard, and for the rest, it was just uh, just a bit of programming uh, to get the uh, get it to respond within the appropriate time constraints and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, so jamming. So how does the jamming work? Um, now, I mean, naturally, if you just you know put out ran random noise all the time, I mean, this would work, <laughs> but that wouldn't be very desirable uh, for for having sort of a, a really selective granular jamming device. So the way that it works, at least with the with the particular ISO standard, 
is uh, during the, uh, when it's doing inventory queries and it's doing anti-collision, it has 16 time slots. So the way that it works is during anti-collision, each of the tags, almost pseudo-randomly, it almost seems pseudo-random, will choose one out of these 16 time slots in which the tag wants to respond. But the point is, this is something we can calculate. This is deterministic. We know exactly how the algorithm works because this is well specified in the standard. So the actual way the tags choose time slot is they'll do an XOR of their, uh, of their tag ID along with something called an anti-collision mask, which is a value that is dictated by the reader, which changes during every round of anti-collision. And essentially, uh, in such a way, each tag can sort of probabilistically choose one out of the 16 time slots, and you sort of hope that, you know, with enough rounds of anti-collision, eventually all of the tags will be able to get their responses back, so they're not, not all sort of talking over each other. So in this example here, um, you can see if we have four tags, let's say the tag one would be talking in time slot five, tag two would be talking in time slot nine, Tag three would be talking in time slot two, and tag four would also be talking in time slot five. So if this was the first round of anti-collision, what would naturally happen would be that the tag three talking in time slot two would be able to get its response back because uh, there's no collisions. So, I mean, it, it, it's basically sending its UID, its tag ID, uh, within the constraints of this time slot, and that's how it's getting its info back. But you would see the tag one and tag four because they both chose time slot five, are going to interfere with each other. And they're going to talk at the same time, and the response is going to be garbled, so you won't be able to understand it. So in the case of with tag one and tag four, what would happen is the reader would then say, OK, you know, let's go to the next round of anti-collision. It changes this anti-collision mask, and then you hope in the next round that tag one and tag four now are going to choose different time slots. Uh, so now, once again, in this next round, they'll be able to get their individual answers back. Now, with the RFID Guardian, we know that in round one, tag two, let's say tag two is a tag we're protecting. Let's say it's, it's my passport, okay? Now, I know that uh, tag two is going to speak in time slot nine, because I can calculate this. So we send out random noise, and that's all it is, random noise during time slot nine. Now, the reader says, OK, I heard there was a collision. Let's go to the next round of anti-collision now. Well, once again, what we do is we calculate, OK, in this next round of anti-collision, I know that the, the, you know, this tag is going to speak in you know, uh, time slot 15. And the point is, we keep injecting random noise into the single time slot where we know the tag is going to be speaking. And the reader goes through 16 rounds of anti-collision and then it gives up. So, and when it gives up, sometimes it'll give a CRC error. Uh, sometimes uh, the re reader doesn't even notice. It actually just depends on how the back end uh, software I is written, whether it'll notice that there's a problem or not. And th that uh, is actually how the, the selective jamming works, as we demonstrated in a video. In such a way, I mean, there's just I mean, the, the chances are just, what is it, 6 to the 16 that you would have another tag that would respond exactly in that same sequence of time slots. <laughs> so the point is, in such a way, you can really granularly say, I'm going to block this tag and that tag, but I'm going to let everything else be able to speak like it's supposed to. So, all right. Um, of course, as hackers, <laughs> I mean, if you want to make a real pain in the butt out of yourselves, <laughs> I mean, you can understand why uh, spoofing and jamming would be useful. But also for consumers, we thought that spoofing and jamming would actually make really interesting primitives for building something that almost resembles an RFID firewall. Now think about this. If you have a firewall for a network, if you have a packet filter, the way that it works is it will analyze uh, incoming packets it will be able to look at the meaning of these packets. So what, what, what exactly is this particular uh, packet attempting to do? Is it setting up a connection, breaking it, uh, trying to send some data? And it can actually make decisions based upon who is sending this packet, what port is it targeting, <laughs> uh, what flags does it have? And it can actually uh, decide whether or not to block it, to filter it, or just to let it go. And this is the basic idea behind the RFID Guardian. 
Uh, right now, RFID activity that's going on around us is not very transparent. It's, it's, I mean, or actually, maybe I should say it's too transparent. <laughs> the point is it's radio waves, and, and as being a consumer, we can't see it. I mean, unless, of course, you have one of these nice uh, wristbands <laughs> with, with the little LED. But the only thing that will show you is that you're in a 13.56 megahertz field. <laughs> but it won't tell you, for example, uh, the, this particular reader is doing an inventory query or this uh, particular reader is trying to target your passport and, and get information from it. So the way that the Guardian works is, uh, okay, it's like a firewall. You can use it to protect either people or fixed locations. So let's say I'd have one of these devices. I'd kind of put it on my belt. And if it has an operational range of about one meter, like I told you before, what you're going to get is sort of like a little zone of privacy. Basically, like from your belt upwards and downwards. Now, if I have an RFID tag on my jacket, and I put my jacket down on a chair and walk away, my jacket is now not protected. But that's the rules of the game. <laughs> you have to understand. This is localized, and you have to understand if you have one of these devices. Within a particular range, you're going to get this protection. If I d decide I want to protect, uh, for example, my living room, <laughs> then I'll, maybe I can put one of these things there with the understanding that just in this one area, <laughs> uh, I'll be able to control the RFID activity going on. Same thing if you're at border control at an airport and you want to make sure there's no unauthorized RFID readers just in that little area where they're scanning your passports, take one of these things, put it <laughs> in, your, uh, in, in that area and it can monitor and control the RFID traffic just in that localized area. So, uh, but what's, uh, what, what, what are some of the main functions that we envision with, the, with this RFID Guardian? Well, the first thing that it's useful for is auditing. So I was talking before about packet filters. I mean, something that we like to do a lot is uh, l look at the network traffic, I mean, perhaps try and analyze it for statistics, how much bandwidth is going on. But, but also, I mean, is, is anybody doing anything they're not supposed to be doing? I mean, you know, should I change my firewall rules? I mean, maybe you want to hang an intrusion detection system on there. <laughs> I mean, the point is that right now with RFID, there is no way to really efficiently monitor the RFID traffic. Now, what you can do with the Guardian is because it can take RFID queries, I mean, just you know, receive them, uh, de demodulate them, decode them, get the information out. We're able to say that, uh, for example, you know, at, at, uh, at 1235, there was a reader that was attempting to read some tags that belonged to me. Now, the point is, if they want to, uh, for example, pass privacy legislation saying that a store needs to signpost what RFID queries that they do, if they're targeting RFID tags belonging to an individual, the point is, as a consumer, how do, you have a no way, how do you have a way of knowing that they're doing the right thing? I mean, how do you actually check to make sure that they're not breaking the rules? Now, if you have one of these devices, what you can do is, with all of the queries that are coming in, you can actually just filter out just you know, the, the, the queries that are relevant to some small subset of tags that belong to you. And, and if enough, I mean, we assume in the, in the first place, you know, normal people aren't going to have such a device. But if you have a couple of gearheads, <laughs> you know, because, <laughs> you know, this is, of course, the, the, the initial group of people that would want one of these things. If you have enough geeks that have one of these devices and then notice that around the time that they were in this department store, someone was scanning tags that would belong to them, then they now have kind of a proof that collectively some of them could actually go to, the, uh, go to the authorities or the Chamber of Commerce and complain. So it gives consumers sort of a, a legal recourse that they might not have had before. Another thing that could also potentially be useful is if you have, uh, let's say that I leave my house first thing in the morning and I have one RFID tag with me. Now let's say I return home at the end of the day and I have two tags. Where did that tag come from? And how as a consumer do I know when that tag was added? And, and perhaps then you can correlate it back to where. If you can uh, routinely or periodically scan to see what tags do I have now that, that, are, that are near me, that are ge geographically near me, you can figure out, depending on how often you scan, exactly when you're acquiring new tags. And if you're not acquiring it through a way that you would expect, <laughs> once again, this gives you sort of more knowledge as a consumer that you wouldn't have had before. 
uh, key management. So, so earlier on, I mentioned uh, kill keys with EPC global tags, sleep and wake modes, uh, some RFID tags have them, and crypto. I mean, certainly your passports have them and uh, all these MyFair tags. But the point is, if you have all these different keys, how do you manage them? How, for example, if you, uh, if you purchase an item, let's say that they have you know, these cryptographic keys associated with it, how do you collect the key? How do you store it? Let's say that I'm, in the, I'm walking down the street and I decide I'm feeling paranoid and I decide I want to kill my tag. How do I do that in practice? If you have such a device with you, of course any RFID reader can do this, <laughs> But the point is, if you have anything that can function as an RFID reader that has this key information, you can then decide, now I want to turn it off. <laughs> but what's useful about the Guardian is because it can do uh, two-way RFID communications, I mean, it can act like a tag, the point is you can now do key transfer without requiring any extra infrastructure besides the actual RFID infrastructure that is already present. As people have discussed, you know, why don't you use Bluetooth and then send it to a PDA and then, you know, maybe have a reader with your PDA. <laughs> that, that's all fine, but that requires extra infrastructure. Uh, same thing if you wanted to give them keys printed on receipts and things like that. This is just an easier way. Uh, access control. So basically, you we, we've already created uh, the access control mechanism. Uh, we actually have ACLs just like a packet filter. Uh, there's actually an example ACL that we work with. I mean, generally, the way that our rules look is we'll say, uh, you have the first line of your ACL. We will say, uh, allow all queries uh, from all readers to all tags. This is sort of the default. Then the next line that makes things a bit more specific will say, but deny all queries from all readers targeting my tags. And then you have a list uh, that we populate that creates what tags belong to me. So do I have a passport with me? Are there tags in my clothing? Uh, do I have one on my credit card? And then the point is then, let's say the next line down, if you want to make it more specific, you can then say, but I would like, uh, you know, only uh, my reader, my trusted reader at home to be able to query uh, the tag perhaps in my clothing, or I would only like the reader at, at, uh, at, at Schiphol Airport <laughs> in the Netherlands to be able to make a query towards my passport. Now, of course, the last detail in, in constructing these kinds of ACLs is this is all well and good, but how do you actually know where the query is coming from? Well, this isn't, this isn't simple, this isn't obvious. But what we do is uh, using a two-way, this two-way RFID channel, we actually use read and write multiple block queries to be able to transmit information, including cryptographic information, <laughs> over RFID. So literally what we are doing in, in the prototype that we've been working on is we are using SSL over RFID. <laughs> This is sort of one of those constructions. <laughs> Granted, it doesn't, it doesn't get the best bandwidth in the world, <laughs> but the point is that as lo it doesn't require any extra infrastructure. As long as you have the readers uh, that speak RFID and, and your guardian, then just using a normal RFID channel, <laughs> first we use SSL. Uh, basically, you have a shared key between the reader and the guardian. They use SSL to do authentication, and then they share a session key. What we do then is we use the session key to encrypt uh, basically, basically individual authenticated packets uh, announcing what query the RFID reader is immediately about to perform. So the way that it works is we, we, for the queries themselves, we have a two-packet system. The first one is this uh, authentication receipt. The second one is the query itself. Why don't we just put cryptographic information in the query itself? Uh, the answer is because generally in the RFID protocol, there's no room for it. <laughs> Uh, this is more of a political issue than a technical one. It would be very easy to add an extra field to the ISO standard uh, for authentication receipts. Why is it not in there? Because if uh, uh, people have proposed putting it in standards like ISO 18000, but if uh, the standard has changed at all, even to add extra security features that technically are just a no-brainer to implement, 
The point is it obsoletes, uh, I mean, there are companies that are involved and that make their entire living from RFID, and these kinds of changes to the standard obsolete their product line. So in these standardization committees, you have these companies that are earning their entire living from RFID, and they are actively fighting against changing the standards <laughs> to, to add this extra security information, this extra field where you can say, okay, this query now belongs to an authenticated session. And because we, I mean, just me personally, I don't have you know, the power to change that. Uh, that's why I've had to use this sort of two-packet system. It's a little bit of a kludge, but it works, <laughs> to be able to actually say that this particular query is part of this authenticated session, where the query itself is actually completely anonymous, because I have no way of actually putting extra information in there. So, so, what, so the reader does is it uh, says, it announces, I am about to do this query. So let's say, I am about to query your passport. It also throws a nonce in there so you can't replay it. And then it encrypts it with a session key. And what happens is then immediately after sending this uh, sort of receipt saying, I'm about to do this query, it then sends the query. So the point is it has to happen immediately afterwards so an attacker won't inject his own query in between there. Uh, if the attacker does try to inject something at the same time, it'll just be garbled because it'll interfere with each other. But the point is, in such a way, we are actually able to know that this particular query is coming from this particular reader. And that's how the Guardian uh, does it. So, uh, so good. Um, so we had some problems with V2 that we're trying to improve. <laughs> uh, we're further working on optimizing uh, the read range. Because, uh, well, like I said, we made a small mistake uh, in V2 with that. Uh, what we're also doing with V3 is, first of all, we're adding uh, Bluetooth. Why? Because our idea is, if you have uh, this device sort of attached to your belt, you would want some kind of easy way of communicating with it. We thought about putting a screen on it, and we decided that one, that's probably not too handy, and two, that's pretty expensive. <laughs> Uh, although I do have to say we have uh, a place where you could plug in a TFT screen, would you want to? But uh, our idea is you would use uh, a cell phone, like a Bluetooth-enabled cell phone. We'd be running SSL basically over the Bluetooth connection, because we, yes, we know about, about Bluetooth security, <laughs> or lack thereof. And the point is then you can use your phone via a Java applet uh, as, as a user interface. Uh, so if on the fly you want to configure your Guardian or uh, you know, do some key transfers on the fly or, or do something, you, you can basically use your cell phone to interface with it. Other changes uh, that we're making, uh, we are trying to uh, actually make the next version cheaper. Uh, we were using some unnecessary components. Uh, in V2, like crystals that were a bit expensive. Uh, we're, we're trying to see if we can replace some of that stuff to make it cheaper. What you actually see right now is not the final V3. It is not the final product. It's what we're using at the moment to do testing. And the difference between uh, V2 and V3, as you can see now, there are all these, essentially what this is, is it's a backplane. It's like a motherboard. And now what we're doing is we're actually taking each individual component, like the Bluetooth module, and plugging it in. So now if we actually make a, uh, make a mistake, or if we have a problem with one of these individual uh, boards, or with one of these designs, in V2, if we made a mistake, it was all on the same board, so it was a real pain in the butt to fix it. <laughs> but now with V3, we're actually individually uh, testing each component, and if it turns out something's broken, we're just going to say, okay, no problem, unplug it, <laughs> and then redesign. But the ultimate V3 isn't going to look like this. Uh, the ultimate V3 is actually going to be professionally produced. <laughs> Because uh, we would actually like to make this into a real thing, and we would actually like to see if we can distribute these in what, some way, shape, or form so people who want to use this technology can. <laughs> but what we're doing now, for now at least is uh, we're, we're still doing the design ourselves, trying to get the pieces right, and as soon as we have a design that works it, basically in all the facets that we want and that we need, we're then going to say, okay, let's make this as simple as possible and get it off to a professional place that can fabricate the PCBs for us and, uh, and uh, you know, populate it with chips and things like that. So that's our idea. And also another thing is once we're actually done uh, with stabilizing our design, um, we're also planning on releasing all of it uh, as open source both the hardware schematics and also the software.
Great. And uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's pretty much the story with the, with the Guardian. So, uh, ooh, how did that slide get in there? <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, so are, does anyone have any questions? Wait, wait. Can you be a bit more specific about your development policy and your prospective uh, production policy, both with respect to software and with respect to the hardware design? What do you mean by development policy? I don't know if you have distinct policies or whether you even have a policy at the moment with openness. Um, well, we've discussed a little bit about like licenses. I, I thought we concluded on using a BSD license for what we could, except for the components that already use GPL, so we're kind of stuck. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that would be my answer, probably BSD to the extent with which we can. So. Uh, yeah, we, we, I mean, we, 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 we still need to discuss this a bit more extensively, extensively once we get that far, but I figure it's probably going to be about six months, probably another six months before we are that far, so, yeah. Um, just one comment, um, you won't be able to selectively block the passport because of the um, randomly generated UID. Uh, no, but the UID is only randomly generated with, uh, for example, EPC tags, because the passport... No, no, no in a passport. Definitely. Oh, you mean with the, uh, with the American ones? No, in oh. everyone, in the um, yes. Dutch and in the Germans, definitely. Um, well, it, I, I would say it depends, because uh, there are some kinds of tags that use randomly generated identifiers. Yeah, I, right. I, I'm talking about the passport. Right, I know, I'm about to answer your question. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are multiple uh, tag, kinds of tags that randomly generate UIDs. The point is, uh, that would then uh, during singulation, yeah, if, if, if it's really truly randomly generated, of course, I have to say pseudo-randomly, <laughs> but the point is, uh, if you don't know the uh, seed to the pseudo-random number generator and you don't know where it is in the sequence, and indeed, during singulation, you wouldn't be able to block it, which prevents tracking. However, uh, what isn't random is uh, once you actually attempt to communicate it with it. It needs a static identifier so you can actually communicate with it. So the point is, once you actually want to do read and write operations with it, <laughs> uh, you can certainly control those kinds of things, and, and also with the passport. But, but I was having that same discussion, actually, about EPC tags. So yeah, indeed. Any other questions? Uh, hello. The, about the, the, the pricing, you said that you're going to try and make it cheaper, but do you have any price indication on how much it will cost? Um, it depends on what we do with our design. The actual, uh, the, the bits that we've built ourselves are very cheap. I'm talking like, you know, 30, 40 euros cheap. <laughs> What is expensive is the Triton module that we've been using, because the PXA270 Triton module costs 330 euros. <laughs> the point is, if we can uh, redesign that, but remember, this is an engineering problem, not a research problem, but still, if we could somehow replace, get rid of the middleman, <laughs> and just solder our own PXA270 and everything, that would eliminate a whole lot of the, uh, the, the price from the equa equation. And then I would assume, in that case, we could probably get it down to... I don't know, 100 euros or something like that. But also, I mean, even with uh, if we decide that the Triton 270 module is overkill, if we could scale back to a Triton uh, 250 module, also from strategic test, those things actually only cost, I think, about, I think, 80 euros a piece. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I, I hope that answers your question. So we're hoping to get it somewhere around in the neighborhood of about 100 euros. So, any other questions? Do you really need a complete X scale for this? I can't imagine you can, can, can't use some smaller processor which doesn't oh. cost 100 euro or so. It depends on what subset of the functionality uh, we want to we wanna go with. Because if we're just building an emulator, you don't need much horsepower for that. I mean, you can adequately use a PIC or an Atmel <laughs> or one of the cheaper microprocessors if all you want to do is emulation or if all you want to do is like replay attacks. <laughs> uh, but we think that the part that is going to require sort of the horsepower, so to say, is uh, SSL. <laughs> so as soon as we're doing this uh, authentication and as soon as we're actually, uh, you know, packet, per packet by packet, <laughs> you know, authorizing, uh, I mean, I think this is the, what, what's going to take the most uh, processing power. And 
essentially in the next six months, we hope to actually get, uh, do some testing of this, get some measurements, figure out to what extent we can scale back. And I mean, definitely the next paper that I'm writing uh, will we'll address issues like this, like can we scale back the processor and to what extent, so. Um, what about legal issues? I could imagine that here. <laughs> that there will be laws against those um, RFID blockers pretty soon, and you can, I imagine you can detect them really easy with a scanner. Right. Um, well, this is sort of why we wanted to make our jamming really, really selective. <laughs> I mean, jamming devices in general are illegal, you're right. But this is sort of why we want to draw the line between jamming tags that belong to you and jamming tags that belong to other people. Yeah, but... Um, what I heard is they want to, the idea is to use them um, like in a grocery store for when you buy your stuff, you put it in a shopping cart and you just walk to the counter and um, pay there without taking all your stuff out of the shopping cart. So before you put it in the shopping cart, you scan your wares um, ID tag, put it in the cart, put the, your blocker next to it and just walk with a right. full cart through right. the scanner. Yes. Um, you're right, you could do this. What we're building is a dual-use technology. It can be used just as much as an attack tool as it can be used a, a defense tool. But the point is that if you want to steal something from a grocery store, you can also put it in a booster bag. You can also put it in a foil-lined bag, <laughs> and that should also be enough to, to get past the security. So there's way more low-tech ways of stealing from the store if that's really what you want to do. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Uh, what about the injecting code or data? using RFID. Is there any proof of concept available for it? In injecting code? Yes, injecting, uh, for example, suppose that uh, the reader sends the code to a database backend and he oh. could inject, for example, SQ SQL. Right, sure. Yeah, this was the RFID malware that I was mentioning earlier. Yes, you could also use the RFID guardian <laughs> as a hacker, <laughs> as a black hat. You could also use it as an attack tool uh, to send buffer overflows, to send code injection attacks, to send whatever. And of course, because it's just an emulator, there's no limitations, really, <laughs> I mean, to what you can send via the RFID channel. But the point is, though, I mean, you can also use tags to do this. <laughs> I mean, if you really do want to send attack, attacks. So I kind of view this a little bit like a pen testing tool. I mean, the point is, it can be abused, but it can also be used for good things. I mean, it's the same thing if you have a hammer. You can use a hammer to hit a nail, or you can hit an hammer, use the hammer to go after your neighbor's ferret or something. So <laughs> but, but the point is, you need, yeah, I, look, I mean, I, we can't dictate the way that people are going to use what we're creating, but the fact of the matter is that the RFID world, including the deployers, need to come to terms with the fact that a device like this can, and at least for now in the laboratory, does exist, and they really need to design their systems appropriately. So, any other questions? Well, I've got a question about the kill command. Um, uh, do they use some sort of shared key, or does every tag has its own key? Uh, every tag will probably have its own key. Oh, a another thing that would be useful also is if occasionally you can uh, re reset the keys or change the keys. That's also just usual good security so procedure. So you can't broadcast kill all, key, uh, all tags? Excuse me? Uh, so you can't do a broadcast which say kill all tags? Um, no, that would be a pretty poorly designed uh, RFID what? tag if you had <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, is it possible to simply destroy the tags with a microwave? As you mentioned before, there are nowadays the not protected RFID tags. Yes. Uh, generally, yes, you can still protect them with... Uh, you know, you can still destroy them using a microwave. I mean, I mentioned earlier that they were designing like anti-microwave -micro RFID tags, but they did admit that you can still kill them with a hammer. <laughs> so maybe next time they're going to make anti-hammer RFID tags. I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> any other questions? Maybe you destroy the goods then too. <laughs> yeah, people are creative. They'll come up with ways, I'm sure. <laughs> so. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you very much. <laughs>